Hey, what's up? It's Jesko again from AcousticsInsider.com, where I teach home studio acoustic treatment techniques for audio professionals, but without all the voodoo. I've got another case study for you today. This is with one of my students, Rudy Pravda from Austria. He did a really excellent job treating his studio with the porous better bass trap that you see in the back of my studio. And I just wanted to share these results with you because it's just incredible what he did and he's a really nice guy and I wanted to dive into his journey of treating the studio so you can get an idea of what it's like if you venture on that journey. But before we get into that real quick, if you want to follow along with the steps that we took to treat his studio, I want you to download my home studio treatment framework, which you can get at the link in the description for free. These are my five steps to systematically treating a home studio and getting it to translate. These are the same steps that I take when I treat a studio. It's what I learned through years of treating different studios, what the right order of things is, what the right approach is in general to treating a home studio. And I wanna share that with you again. This is for free at the link in the description, my home studio treatment framework. And with that, let's jump into this call with Rudy Pravda. Enjoy. Hey everybody, it's Jesko from AcousticsInsider.com where I teach home studio acoustic treatment techniques for audio professionals, but without all the voodoo. I've got another special episode for you today because I'm joined by one of my students, Rudy Pravda from Austria, I believe. And, That's right. Uh, welcome, thanks for joining me. Thank you, Jesko. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to talk to you about your room, obviously, give people an impression of what you do, what your room is like, what you experienced going through the process of treating your room, also with the help of my courses. And so just for you to give us a, an overview of, uh, of what that was like and what's, what your experience with the room is like now. Um, but maybe just to get started, do you want to just quickly introduce yourself? You're a drummer, but you do mastering work professionally now. Do you want to just give me a quick rundown of, of what, what work you actually do in the studio? Yes, of course. Right now, I'm more in the mastering world, of course, that's right. So, but my whole journey in music started a couple of years ago, actually more than 25 years ago, uh, playing bass and guitar in my youth in a punk rock band. And with all that left, uh, the guys that were in the band were a couple of years older than me, so they went for studying and uh, a drum set was left in my place. So that's right. the reason why I became a drummer. It was much more fun to play the drums by myself than to play the bass guitar. And um, after a couple of years, I started studying classical percussion at the uh, conservatorium in Klagenfurt. That's uh, right. a state conservatory. And after the studies in Klagenfurt, I went uh, a year to Los Angeles to study at the Los Angeles Music Academy with uh, Ralph Humphrey and Joe Porcaro. Uh, Joe's uh, pretty known. His sons were the founders of the band Toto, if that's known for some, I think most people will know it. Sure. And yeah, and after that, I started teaching for the Corinthian State Music School. And I was always in, in the recording world as well, because I like to know how to record drums and, and do stuff like that. I also do uh, drum recordings that are remote, so people send me tracks and I will record drums for them to replace the program parts that they had on. Mm -hmm. And in, during the last couple of years, uh, mainly the last three years, I started developing more into the mastering world. So I took a class at Friedemann Tischmeier's mastering uh, Academy, which was almost a year and pretty intense and pretty interesting. And so my focus totally changed from recording back to, to mastering. And that's the whole place where the journey started with uh, improving my room and uh, searching for solutions, basically. And the first idea was, okay, I take the cash, I build a new room. And right. once I saw how much I would have to pay for a new room, sure. I was like, okay, let's try to make the best I can with what I have right now and improve on it. And that's basically why I joined your class and we had a short video call at the beginning to uh, see how it all could work. And you were like, oh, check out, there's a new uh, course coming out. It's a build a better, better bass trap. And that's what I did. So I bought the course I think as soon as it, is, uh, as it was released. Sure, it thank you. Took, yeah, it took me almost, uh, I think, two and a half years to finish all the process because with all the building and stuff like that, 
it was quite a challenge, not the building uh, of the models itself, but uh, the time that went in actually. It's one I always built four modules and put them away and got materials for four new one and stuff like that. And in total, I've put almost 40 models in my room. So it's quite, yeah. quite a big load, uh, but it was worth the effort and the results changed dramatically. Like uh, we, I think um, in my room, it was a rehearsal space from my youth on. So what, what we did back then was uh, go to a pharma and buy what, is, what are they called the eggshell uh, or egg boxes. <laughs> we plastered the whole room with it. So it was gray and, and dark and, and uh, not, not a beautiful place to spend time in here anyway. And sure. uh, with the remodeling, all that stuff changed. I really love how it looks. I love to work here. It sounds different and I'm still getting used to it because the acoustic impressions I got, I was so used to my old room. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that was quite an interesting experience. We've also moved from this place to another place a couple of years ago and I tried to set up a room over there as well to, to mix and record mm -hmm. and it didn't work at all. So mm -hmm. the room dimensions were too small. I couldn't get used to switching rooms. It was like always you, you think, ah, I, I will do this and tweak this. And you go back to the other room and think, no, that's not at all what should happen. So I left the idea behind with a with, uh, uh, room in, in my house. I have something to practice and I can record drums, by, but I'm not mixing over there and stuff like that. I, mm -hmm. If I do stuff at home, I check it on headphones. That's usually the most reliable source that I can take with me when I'm on the road. Sure. But all work that uh, needs a room or needs hardware or something like that is all done here in Maria Saal. Gotcha. Did mm. you um, did you do any treatment in the other room as well? I, yes, I did. I, I built bass traps for the other room as mm -hmm. well. They are still there uh, and okay. it helped me with the acoustics because I practice drums at home. But um, the room dimensions were so small that I had standing waves all over the place. And even with calibration, I, I especially for, for the room in, in Mosbach, I bought a set of Genilex uh, mm -hmm. that had the um, SA, Indo Sam. Yeah, yeah, yeah Sam, uh, the, the measurement, and I could not work with it. It, right. it, it didn't fit, uh, it didn't fit the room. Probably it didn't fit my ears. I'm used yeah. to my focal speakers and they have a uh, quite unique character that I really enjoy and they show me stuff that I need to tweak. And I think it was more the room than the speakers, actually. I've never mm -hmm. tried the Genilex here, so I, I've left them in Mosburg. And as soon as I realized that it wouldn't work, I sold them again. So no right. opportunity to, to go back. But, but I like the system. That's probably one of the points that show me that I need improvement. But I mm -hmm. think it's more in the speakers than in the room, actually. Because with, with the treatment that I've done, I think it's it's basically more or less all that you can do with the budget that, I'm, that okay. I have. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Yeah. And just moving to this room now, did uh, can you can you give me a description of what that room is in in its empty state? What kind of room are we dealing with here? Are you dealing with? Did you deal yes. with? Yes, I'm, I'm in, a, in a basement room. Uh, the mm -hmm. dimensions are uh, six and a half meters in length four and a half meters in width and two and a half meters in height. So it's basically your standard basement room, uh, but nothing nothing special. So n not too many doors, not too many angles, basically a, a square. Um, and, and, and it's, and it's a it's a tiled floor. I see. I saw yes, or we can yes. see in the pictures. Yeah. Is it brick brick walls as well? I guess. Y yes. Yes. It's brick walls. And, so it must uh, have been crazy reverb times in there in the empty space. Yes. Um, before I had the treatment, I always had carpet in the air to, to right. somehow deal with the reflections. And that was also a thing that I thought, oh, I will need a carpet again. Mm -hmm. And um, actually, with the measurements and how it feels in here, I don't need it. So yeah. uh, I, I've done uh, a couple other things as well. Uh, a friend of mine gave me some acoustic panels. Those those are um, so um, Faserplatte. I'm not quite sure how to. Yeah, 
Uh, I know, I'm not sure what the name is right yeah, now, so but it's it, like it's, it's an acoustic panel, and uh, and I, I I treated parts of the ceiling with it, so the ceiling has now different steps in height as well, and I think that takes good care of it. I still have a ca uh, carpet underneath or drum rack underneath my drum set, but uh, other than that, it's the tile flooring, and maybe someday I will put a carpet in here, but I think it's actually not necessary. It sounds good. It sounds good when I play my drums acoustically and it sounds good when I listen to music. So it's not annoying like it used to be when the room was empty or just had the egg. Yeah. Uh, egg. Yeah, kind of. yeah. Yeah, it's funny because I just made a video about that, I don't know, two weeks ago. And uh, it would have been great if you had taken measurements back then when you did that with the egg cartons, because I don't think anybody has ever done that before. Yeah. But um, just on a side note, but and on the, the topic of the carpet, it confirms what I always say is that obviously a carpet in an empty space can help reduce the reverb time to make it just more comfortable to be in. But once you get started actually treating the room with proper absorption, you actually don't need the carpet in there. You don't even want the carpet in there necessarily because uh, the, the reverb time is taken care of by all the panels. And uh, in that case, you don't, you don't need or you don't even want any added absorption by a carpet that won't do anything else for you really apart from just dragging down the reverb time, you know? So yeah. I'm, yeah. I, I'm glad to hear it just, especially in a, in a tiled with a tiled floor, you can do, do just fine uh, if you just approach the treatment properly. Yeah, um, and it's actually quite yeah. interesting. When I record drums, I actually prefer to have not as much carpet underneath my drums. So uh, especially if you, for all you drummers out there, try it. Take a snare drum, put it on a carpet, hit it, take it and put it on a wooden floor and hit it again. The sound is different. You would not expect it. There's so much that, uh, so much reflection from the floor that actually can be quite helpful in the recording, especially if you want to capture a little bit of your room sound mm -hmm. and it should not be dead. Uh, it makes, it makes a lot of difference. So, uh, every once in a while, if I have something that, that needs a special sound, I would actually use smaller strips of carpet just to go under the pedals and the drums and let the rest stand on either wooden floor or, uh, or on the tile floor and it records differently and sounds differently. Ah, good to know. Good to know. Um, talking about the, the actual space, you said that this is your old band rehearsal space. Is that yes, correct? Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. So before you went through the Better Bass Trap course and you did all this construction, did you have any treatment in there before? What was it like before? Uh, it was basically an... Uh, Basement. I, I have uh, uh, carpets that we hung from the wall to mm -hmm. cover up a big storage space that uh, okay. I, I, I still have. So I'm a drummer. So everything you have gets quite big. And especially if you play drums for a little while, there are drum sets piling up and stuff like that. Uh, and so I had always had a, a carpet that would hide a little bit of that. And I still use it. I might turn the camera around and show you that may maybe a little bit later. If you have, we can see some pictures maybe. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah or, or, or pictures that that's, that's also possible. And that's the that's the thing that was in here. Besides the eggshells, I had carpet and that that was probably it. So uh, really? okay. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, we had we we were pretty motivated. So we <laughs> eggshelled the whole room every corner, every wall, and the ceiling as well. So it was great, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and when once I started uh, studying music, I spent hours here and I couldn't stand the look of gray cardboard. So I took off strips uh, and painted it uh, with yellow and red uh, to, to get some color in here. To, so at least it, it would feel a little bit more comfortable to me but that had nothing to do with the sound at all. And um, the, okay. the decision to yeah. to renew the room and do all the stuff was basically the thing that I said, okay, I want to go mastering and I want to do more work in the studio. And I wanted to have look professional, feel professional and sound good. Excellent. Okay, so I, yeah, so now I understand. So you actually went from eggshells or yeah. egg cartons to yes. what you have now. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, no yeah. intermediate step. That yeah. is crazy. Yeah. Um, and so, but uh, did you actually do any mastering work in the room, or did you did you did you put up a speaker setup in the room as yes. it was before? Yes, I, ha I had a speaker setup. Uh, I didn't use it as much for mastering, but I was recording quite a bunch. And um, the 
the thing about it is I was so used to it that I could work with it. So it, it mm-hmm. didn't bother me. I knew my room inside out. I've, uh, it, it's basically the, the basement is in, in the house of my parents. So I mm-hmm. lived here. All I had to do was go down a couple of steps and I could listen to music and practice all day long. And that's, I think that that's an important part of it because I had the ability to use it whenever I wanted it. And so I knew what it sounded like. I knew music by heart. I didn't even have to turn on the speakers to know in which key the song is or basically in which key it yeah. starts and stuff like that. So that, that was pretty, pretty cool. But as we were moving out, I, kn- I knew that we had to, or I had to find a way to, to, to take that space to, to another level, to, to make it more reliable, reliable because I didn't spend as much time as I used to here. Uh, I didn't have a, it didn't, didn't have had a stereo in my room because when I wanted to listen to music, I went in the basement and listened to music here. And so all the time spending to, or listening to music was basically in this room. So I really knew it by heart. You got really used to it. Yeah, mm-hmm. interesting. So then jumping forward, you basically decided to treat this room and and move it a whole step forward. Mm-hmm. Um, you already said that it took you about two years to go through everything and, and get yeah. it all done. But did you did you actually start with the the placement of your setup as well? You mentioned before that you redid the bass hunter technique to 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 optimize the listening position. Yes. Do you want to just yes. walk me through that real quick? Did you do that in the empty room or as in as in how you had it before? How did that look? And what what order did you go through that process? And walk me through that. Yeah, the room was almost empty. So uh, as as I told you, I had quite a lot of stuff that was in here and uh, got piled up over almost 25 years of playing. So <laughs> I threw a couple of things out and uh, I moved a couple of things in another room. So I had at least a somewhat empty space. And then I tried your bass hunter technique, like setting up a speaker in the corner and putting music on and walking the axis of the room to find out where, where the sweet spots are or where the bass builds up or where it goes goes away completely. And I've already read a couple things before, like the 38% rule and, and stuff like that. So I had at least an idea where I should where it should be, at, at least in, in my opinion. And it actually was a little bit farther back uh, mm-hmm. than, than I thought it will be. Uh, but once I had that, I knew I, I just duct taped a, a big cross on, on the on the floor and said, "Okay, that's it. That will be the listening position." And then afterward, I started like um, painting the whole room, putting in the modules, trying out how to to stack them and how to secure them so they don't fall over and stuff like that. And I actually got pretty lucky. Uh, because of the okay. dimensions of the panels, uh-huh. uh, your your plan is always for panels that are one meter in height. Mm-hmm. And we have a rock wool company that does um, a rock wool that is one meter and twenty five in mm-hmm. height. Mm-hmm. So I could use two of two of those panels, and they stack right up. And so I'm just an, a centimeter underneath Excellent. the ceiling, so they, they cannot Super fall over. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So that that's pretty cool. Yeah. Excellent. And, and so the the in terms of actually putting in the panels where did you start you said you did it in in steps yes where, yes. where did you start and how did you progress through actually treating them when did you say okay i'm i'm i've got enough yeah um i, I always had the, the plan in mind um that that i will need well, i when we talked the first time um you basically said during our first um meeting oh for for this dimension you would probably probably need around 40 modules so that mm-hmm. was my benchmark gotcha. and okay. since, mm-hmm. since since the modules got a little bit bigger um i i originally wanted to do 40 mm-hmm. but i ended with with 36 because each of the panels is like almost a quarter higher than they than they should be or are in your plans and um i knew that i was finished or basically i i, I built all the modules 
and I started to stack him in and you have it laid out in your course really, really well. I started with the corners and that's where all the magic happens. So each of the corners is treated. And um, so I have stacks like you have behind you in each of the corner uh, on the walls and where it was possible. I also have it on the corners in the uh, to the ceiling, but I have two smaller windows. So on there's just one on on each side on the long side, but there are two on the on the shorter side. Then I started in filling in the rest. So I tried to basically have a, a pretty reflectionless zone where where all the mastering stuff is happening. And I have a section that 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 is more lively. The side where I do mastering and mixing work is pretty much covered wood panels. Uh, I, I have some panels with the diffuser slats in front of it. Mm -hmm. And there, the other the other part of the room where the drum set is, is a little bit less uh, um, treated as, as mm -hmm. you might see. But um, I, I took the idea of your base traps that have the fabric or the diffuser slats. And I built some panels that have the fabric on one side and the diffuser slabs on the other side. Ah, clever! So I, I can I can use them for drum recording as gobos, and I have four of those, so I can put them around the drum set when I need a space that feels tighter. And I can even change the sound a little bit if I put the diffuser slab side to the drum set, or if I turn them around and have the fabric side. So it, it makes it quite quite a lot. Uh, or it makes it versatile. And those are models yeah. that I can take off and, and put right to the drum set. And if I don't need them, I put it back on the on the uh, mixing or mastering side of the room. Interesting. That's really interesting. Um, what's your experience with the the uh, how the sound varies when you flip it around? How would you describe that? Uh, it's actually not uh, not that big. If mm -hmm. you if you wouldn't put be, it really yeah. close to an to an instrument. Um, I do have the feeling that it gives a little more if the if the diffuser slat side is is really close to an instrument. You have a little bit more reflections of of the high tones, so to say. If if you have a a fabric really close to it, it it, it darkens it a lot. But but those are actually I think nuances. Um, yeah. I'm not quite sure if 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 you feel it when you play it, but it's not always the case that the microphone is picking up what you feel. Yeah. So yeah. every once in a while, it's, it depends on the microphone. Usually I do that when I, when I have a floor tom that I try to put a gobo right next to it to to get it a little bit out of the of the resonant side or close to the snare drum if I want it to feel tight in the recording. But that actually helps quite a lot. And Okay, good. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have expected to be a huge difference because it is a very yeah. much a high frequency diffuser, and so um, yeah. it, I wouldn't expect it to make a huge difference. Uh, but that's good to know. Um, when when we look at you, the front of your room, you double stacked the panels. Yeah, yeah. What what made you do that? Um, what made me do that? I have a fireplace that sits right in the corner behind <laughs> one of, of those panels. And okay. so uh, I, I used um, two layers of panels to emulate the fireplace on the other corner. And, uh, and that's the reason why they are double stacked in front of me to, to uh, absorb the difference basically i could have left it empty as well and i thought about that to to use the air behind the models uh, but it felt better this way it was a trial and error and but i don't have a scientific explanation i mean uh, well <laughs> added depth always helps with low end absorption yeah. and if we look at the waterfall plot for example from your room we can we can very clearly see just how low down the absorption yeah. actually works I mean, that's one of the, or I mean, I always say that with these types of panels, it's kind of the best bang for the buck um, compromise, in my opinion, and it kind of roughly works down to 40 hertz. Mm -hmm. But in your room, we can see that it, that lowest standing wave that remains is actually at 25 hertz. And even yeah. there, there's some damping happening. And that surely is a result of you actually adding all that depth in. Yeah, um, I think so. So it, it worked wonderfully. 
Um, and actually, that kind of brings me to that that question with with what remains in the low end are you still perceiving that how how are you working with what still remains that the fact that it isn't perfectly controlled yeah um it's it's like you said it's pretty low down so i usually work on speakers when i'm mastering but i'm always double checking on headphones mm -hmm. and i have headphones uh, that play really really deep down i have a good headphone amp that that makes a lot of sense to to really uh, go down and I also check um, on uh, frequency uh, gra graphics display. A so a, a spectrum a, a, analyzer, a, a mm -hmm. spectrum analyzer that helps me I identifying if there are problems in a certain region that I might not be able to hear. But as far as it was going, I wouldn't have needed it actually because mm -hmm. it's okay. it's so low down and usually in in in. in in the frequency range that we're talking about, there's just sub bass. So if you do, maybe if you do movie stuff where you have those really deep sub basses for explosions or whatever, then th that might be something that you have to consider. But uh, at the moment, I think it's not a big issue. So most people are listening to music on earbuds or headphones that don't play those regions. And if you want your music to have a certain dynamic range, and a certain loudness to to be able to get it out there you always have to check the the, the frequency uh frequency uh balance in any case because if you have to make it to a certain level there's no room for a big bass that that stands there alone so i actually never run it ran into issues with that what took me a while was getting used to how it sounds now before uh, or after the treatment, but mm -hmm. but that's a learning process, of course, L like it always is, always is. And I think the reason that I kept the same speakers made the transition a little bit easier. So I think mm -hmm. if I ever switch out the speakers, I at least know the room and the speakers. So then it's just w uh, one one thing that is changing, and I know how the room sounds. So yeah, um, that that's one thing. And I've tried to use. EQ on the speakers to mm -hmm. I was to just gonna even ask mm -hmm. to, to even out the stuff and it didn't work for me I'm, mm -hmm. I, I'm I, I cannot explain it but but to me it it changes the picture of the music I, I rush modern know that there is a little bit more bass in my room and I feel it and I know that it's supposed to sound like that it, it in, instead of car carving it out with an EQ and then have some other issues. Because if you use uh, EQ that's face aligned, you get all this latency. So if you start editing, you, you don't know exactly, ah, oh, is it this or is it that? And, and that makes it difficult. And switching between different EQs for room correction is actually not an option for me. It's yeah. either on or either off. Absolutely. But, uh, but, but uh, the, 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 the switch between did, didn't make it easier for me. So I stayed with the speakers as they are um, and, mm -hmm. and that's it. Yeah, no, that's I think that's great because um, it should it should always that uh, EQing your speakers should always be the absolute last step in the chain. Mm -hmm. And you should really only do it, first of all, if you really need it and only to the extent that it just improves it to the extent yeah, that you need it yeah. and no more yeah. than that because it comes with such heavy compromises. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, your 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 frequency response actually looks really, really good. Yes. Um, so you, you don't really need it. Um, yeah. I guess some touching up could always help in theory, but then there's that, there's the taste thing, but also the, the side effects in terms of headroom, in terms of potentially delay, mm -hmm. possibly phase effects if we're talking about linear phase EQs. Yeah, um, that yeah. that all also need to be considered and that play into how the system sounds. So yeah. I'm I'm not at all surprised that you said you know what I don't need it I don't want it because it it's it's actually not making things better. Yeah, I, I think I think um, if if I had to make it work I could, but the latency issue was the was the thing that I I didn't like about it because it, it make editing and stuff. If if you wanna hear. A fade uh, on and mastering. It's it's always important to have the tracks uh, fade over or one track to the next. The spacing should be correct, and, and 
it's those little details that you click and drag with a mouse and you want to hear it when you start playing and it's always you press and it starts playing and the cursor is already moving so mm -hmm. you don't know where it is so annoying and and, and i i couldn't stand that actually yeah yeah Totally. Maybe um, I just want to jump on to uh, the topic of the desk because I've since we started talking, I, I've been eyeing that lovely mastering desk. Is that yeah. something you built yourself? Did yes, you buy that? I, I, I did. I did. Um, I'm not quite sure that. if 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 um, I'm doing really a favor if I tell the story about it, but. I was <laughs> tell always me, tell it to the extent that you want to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I hope I don't get sued by by Sterling Sound because uh, sure. that, that that was the model for for the desk. Mm -hmm. I always I, I've always seen in mastering studio the, those beautiful Sterling Sound desks, and uh, I said I, I want to have one of those, but they're so expensive. And Sterling Sound has a quite a couple nice manuals with measurements on them, so I printed them out. I tried to Interesting. re uh, how, how do you say reverse engineer a storing sure. sound desk, and that's what happened. It's actually just plywood and a little bit of acacia, okay, acacia. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh -huh. and uh, yeah. I'm, once, sure, once it's, I'm sure it's fine because <laughs> I mean they they yeah. it, it is it is a tribute to how good their desks are. Yes, yes, and if course. somebody puts in if somebody puts in the time. To uh, to go through that process because building your own desk is not easy, you know. Yeah. When everybody yeah. somebody tells me if or asks me if they should build their own desk, I'm like, look, if unless you are a skilled woodworker, I wouldn't recommend it. And even then, you need to consider the time and the money involved because the materials yes. are going to be relatively expensive. It is not an easy project to build a mm -hmm. properly designed and high end studio desk. And yeah. uh, if you've done that once, you know why they they are so expensive. Yes, and of course, yeah. In many cases, it is just at least uh, it's in many cases, it's probably cheaper, if not the same price to just buy it as it is, um, yeah, because yeah. the time involved and the materials make it very expensive very quickly. Yes, that, that's absolutely right. And it, if, if you build it by yourself, you know all the flaws it has. So yeah. uh, that, that's, that's one, one thing about it. But um, if, if I could do it again, I would do a couple of things different just for, for, for organization stuff. But uh -huh. that, yeah, that's that's some some of the inside I could have done better with the with the spacing in between, right? So that the units fit 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 in better. But uh, I think if if you have the tools to do it and you want to try it, there's so many resources out there that that tell. I, I was researching quite a lot before I I did this, and I still made some some tweaks to to my to my liking. It's not a one on one clone actually, but sure. Uh, what did you have before? What, what, what was your, your previous desk? A an IKEA desk. Yeah, <laughs> just yes. a flat desk. Yes, just a flat desk. It probably worked, right? I mean, tell me about yes. uh, like yes. how 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 big is the difference now? I mean, workflow. I'm sure it's quite different, but yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, to be honest, I, I didn't use hardware before, so the, okay. all the hardware stuff uh, actually started with the mastering course. Uh, and I always thought, oh, I think I don't need hardware, software is getting so good, and it actually is. But there's always this little thing that sometimes a hardware unit can do that the software isn't yet able to do. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I started to get some tools, and once I had the hardware, I knew I need something where I can quickly access it without changing my listening position. Mm -hmm. And that's where the idea from the desk came. Uh, so okay. I had I had the hardware lying on a desk beside me and I was trying to dial it in and I would have to move back and forth. And that's the reason why it's in, in the desk right now. OK, and gotcha. Yeah, the, the table wasn't. I think it was working fine. I always uh, used a, a DAW controller when mm -hmm. I was mixing stuff. So I, I always liked the feeling of faders, even mm -hmm. if I if I if I if I was totally uh, digital with recording and mixing and stuff like that. And I especially liked if, if I had to put in automation, I could just record the automation and write a fader. It made it so much easier than clicking and dragging uh, totally. with, with the mouse. I, I really enjoyed that. And th that that was basically the thing. The the table was fine as long as it, as it was, was just the hardware control. I'm sorry. And since I moved to hardware during the mastering process, it made a lot of sense to remove the table and get something. 
that that is okay, working gotcha. for that. Yeah, mm -hmm. totally makes sense. Um, coming coming back to the the actual acoustics in the room, after going through this entire process two questions I really have for you. One is, what was your biggest kind of aha moment? What was your biggest realization that you maybe didn't expect? And also, what would you recommend to other people going through this process? The biggest realization, um, actually, that you can do quite a lot by yourself mm -hmm. and, uh, and th that you just have to get started. So mm -hmm. they're just always just saying, ah, I, I will do it, I will do it. And uh, you, you have to start it and you have to try it. And I think the best way is to, to go ahead and start with a couple modules and put it in your room and, and see if, it, if and how it changes the room. And if you like it, build a couple more and, and put them in and start working in, in, in that order. I think uh, what's, what's really cool about is that you have it laid out in your course where you should treat your room first and if you do that you're uh, on, the, on the right direction if you start with the corners and stuff like that I think it will improve your room pretty quickly if you have a couple modules in the corner and that's the point where I think you might change your view and say okay I'm I'm going for it I, I build a couple more and try to, to slap them in my room and check it what it's how it's changing and how it's different gotcha. yeah yeah and uh, what would you recommend for somebody who's maybe just getting started uh, or is thinking about this when they when they maybe if they're considering diying building themselves in comparison to buying some ready-made modules yeah yeah um i think i think if you're if you're able to operate a drill and um, probably a saw <laughs> you can save a lot of money Actually, I had a, um, a company that um, was checking out my room and I had an offer to acoustically treat it for around 10,000 euros. Mm -hmm. So uh, with, with your course and all the materials and all the wood prices and stuff that went through the roof, because the first uh, wood boards I bought for six euro 90 and the last one, the same boards I bought for 17 euros 20. Damn. so yeah it, it, it's it's crazy but i think even with the prices today you're still quite a lot cheaper it's more affordable more affordable and maybe you 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 have different options on panels that are already finished with different veneers and stuff like that so if you if you want to have it uh, a certain way or a certain look, then then you might consider other options as well. But I think in terms of results and how it looks, as you probably see on the pictures, I really like it. I really enjoy it. And I'm not sure if something that's just a couple of centimeters of thickness with a wood surface can actually do what any of, of those panels is able to do and uh, sound first, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Excellent. Um, maybe to round this off, because I think we covered a whole lot of good stuff already, but maybe just to round this off, give me something that you really like about your room and mm -hmm. something that you don't necessarily like all that much yet and you might actually improve on in the future. Yeah, um, there's one thing that I would really like to improve, but yeah. it's actually not uh, not an option. I would like my room to have more height. So if <laughs> I ever yeah. gonna build a room, or if I ever have the chance to design a studio, I, I do like the dimensions with width and length. It feels not too big. It feels not too small. I'm used to the size, but mm -hmm. I would like to have just a meter or, or maybe one and a half meters more on height, just for feeling wise. It's, it's um, when we record in studios and there's room above the drums, it always makes it so much easier to play because the, the low ceiling height with two and a half meters always um, makes I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure how I should describe it but it always feels like you're right under the ceiling when you're playing mm -hmm. and th that makes it hard especially if you play cymbals and snare drum stuff that reflects from the ceiling pretty quickly uh, that that makes it hard and I think it would be also a good uh, a good way um, 
to improve the mastering process. If you have more room height, probably the frequencies can expand a little bit more and, and you, you m might get a clearer picture in terms of where stuff is placed in the stereo image. And I think that gets a little bit compressed with the lower ceiling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So th that, that would be one thing that I would like to change, but I'm not able to change in the near future. Sure. So yeah. I'm, 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 I will make the best out of it. And, and um, there are a couple of things that I, I like about the whole mm -hmm. stuff. First of all, my room feels totally different. So mm -hmm. I'm really looking forward when I have to work here because it, it feels nice. It feels comfy. I love how it sounds here. And um, there's one thing that has changed since I moved out and it's the fact that I don't have access to my room 24 seven. Mm -hmm. So I'm way more prepared when I have to do stuff. Mm -hmm. Even for mastering stuff, I prepare stuff at home. So I set up my WaveLab session, the routing is done, the everything I need is already in the project. So when I come here, I just load the project and I'm ready to go. And that makes it, uh, makes it easier in terms of time, but it also feels nice. So every time I get here, it's not searching for cables. It's not, it's not cleaning up a space or something like that. It's started up, ready to go. And that makes it a lot of fun. So time, time well spent and it's, it sounds good. It looks good. It feels good. It's so, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Professional workflow. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. That's amazing. Rudy, maybe it's good we leave it at that. I think that's a great um, jumping off point. Um, a marvelous mastering is yeah, your yeah. mastering studio <laughs> yes. for everybody who wants to check that out. Thanks for sharing with us uh, your story and everything you've done. And uh, thanks for joining me and enjoy the rest of your time in the room. I really hope that it gives you lots more, plenty of good time and, and good quality work uh, coming out of the, that room. Thank you, Jesko. It was really a pleasure. Uh, I hope my English is not too bad for for all of you guys out there. But <laughs> I'm fine. always trying. I'm always trying to somehow get it through. It, it's, it's always fine. the Perfect. case: use it or lose it. And we don't have a lot of use for English in Austria. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. Thanks, Rudy. All good. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.